Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Shane Gebauer with Brushy Mountain Bee Farm. I'm the general manager here. I'd like to welcome everyone uh, this evening. If you've been sitting watching, um, we've been uh, scrolling through some slides. We've just got a little bit of a, a technology issue here this evening. Um, that's uh, at Advanced Jennifer. Um, we've got uh, Jennifer Berry with us this evening. Um, and uh, she's the one actually doing the, uh, the presentation. And we're just having a little bit, uh, a bunch of people in some suits there. Uh, we're having a little bit of an issue with um, the slides advancing. They're advancing, but uh, there's a tremendous lag time from when she actually pushes the button to when we actually see it displayed. Um, but what we're trying to do is sort of get stuff loaded into a queue so it uh, advances a little bit faster, some pollen. Um, so it advances a little bit faster uh, when she's actually going through her presentation. So I apologize for the, uh, the inconvenience here, but it's probably been a little entertaining, probably better than just looking at a, a blank screen. Um, and you're getting a preview to, uh, to what it is she'll be talking about this evening. Um, before we get started, uh, I'll give you a quick introduction uh, to Jennifer, uh, some, some honey in a frame there. Um, Jennifer Berry is uh, with the University of Georgia. She uh, does a tremendous amount of research down there. And one of the things that, uh, that I really like about the things that she's doing is that it's, it's practical research. It's not sort of, uh, well, I don't want to disparage any, any other research that's out there, but it's, it's information um, that uh, pertains. We've got some bees in a, a frame there. It looks like a dead out from winter. Um, it, uh, it's, it's information that you and I as a beekeeper can take and apply and utilize in our practice. Our bee, uh, um, ooh, that's, that's a whole lot of dead bees in there. That we can utilize um, in our day-to-day -day operation uh, to make us better beekeepers. Um, so uh, I'm really excited to have her here with us this evening. She also um, does things like show baggy feeders. Uh, it looks like this, you know, so she's a beekeeper as well, trying to keep her cost down. But she does uh, queen rearing. Um, uh, Brushy Mountain sells uh, her queens. Uh, we've tested her queens. Um, that one advanced, Jennifer. Um, and have been very, very pleased. Uh, we put some in the hive uh, a couple of years ago, and that queen came right out. She was big and plump, plump and uh, hit the ground running and had uh, tremendous, that's a pretty one, uh, tremendous success with her queen. She's one of uh, the few uh, queen breeders that I am aware of, that's good, um, that I'm aware of that actually uses statistical, truly statistical analysis to uh, select breeders and also uh, good quality queens. Um, and, and tries to deal with that little bugger, the Varroa, um, in uh, some of her selection process. So uh, she's doing some fantastic work um, and, and I'm really pleased to have her here with us this evening. Um, Jennifer, we're looking at uh, some sack brood and, and some more Varroa. How many more slides do you have until you get to the end? I'm looking at about Okay. We'll just, uh, just a few more. We'll advance through those and then we'll get started. Uh, there's some more disease. Um, while we're doing that, uh, for the benefit of um, everyone, uh, mostly uh, for Jennifer and myself, uh, here this evening, we'd like to know a little bit um, uh, where people are coming from in terms of background. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll. And if you could just take a, a second here, and there's some high beetle. Ooh. Um, and, and just um, go ahead and, and respond to this poll so we have a sense of where people are coming from. Um, I've got 46, 56, 63, 75. 80, over 80% 80 uh, reporting in. I'm going to go ahead and close this poll in, in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And last minute, last second votes. And I'll close that. And let me show I got some colony record there. Uh, I'll show you the results. So we've got uh, a few people listening this evening that uh, have not started yet. 3%, uh, 34 in the, uh, the first year, 
and 52 that have been doing this a few years and 11% and that have been doing this five plus years. So that just gives us a, a really good um, sense of, of where people are, are in terms of their beekeeping experience and background uh, and will help us with this, with this evening. Um, procrastination, that's me right there. Um, so with that said, uh, now that we've got um, uh, not keeping current with information, I'm hoping that, uh, that I've stalled sufficiently to allow Jennifer to get through the end of her slides, or pretty close to it, so we can turn it over to, uh, to Jennifer Berry. Jennifer, go ahead and take it away. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm assuming everybody can hear me. Uh, I will say this is a bit strange. This is my first webinar, and I guess I need to move into the 21st century because this is probably what we're going to be doing in the next 10 years instead of speakers traveling all across the United States. We will be um, coming to you uh, via the internet. So anyway, welcome. Um, I am going to try to go back to my original slides and, or my original beginning slide here. Here we go. What I want to talk to you, you all about this evening is what can happen, what can go wrong with your colonies. Here where I'm at, I'm in Athens, I'm in central Georgia in the Piedmont region, and we pretty much have finished our swarming season. We are, uh, as a matter of fact, our nectar flow is almost done. Once the privet stops blooming in this area, we get a little bit of clover still dragging on, some persimmons, various other plants. But uh, the, the big flow is over. And as you know, for those of you who have been beekeeping for some time now, it looks like, what you say, Shane, 50, 52%, I believe, you have probably experienced swarms. Now, swarming is a natural phenomenon for colonies. It's their way to reproduce. Gen and Jennifer, I, I just want to um, interject a little bit. I'm getting some, some folks uh, responding in that they're having a difficult time hearing you. Um, is there any way to sort of get a little closer to your mic? Um, there's, it, it, if possible, that, that would be fantastic. Otherwise, uh, I'm not sure. I've, I've checked my settings here to see if I could turn up your... Uh, volume and, and unfortunately I don't have that ability so um, if you are having a difficult time hearing I, I apologize but crank those speakers up and Jennifer if you can use that booming voice that I know you've got that'd be great too. <laughs> um, let me go ahead and do a test and see those people that are having difficulty if they can hear me better now. Go ahead, and if you can just let her know how she's sounding uh, a little better, they're saying, a better, better. Better, better. See, yep, they're saying better. Okay. Well, I just wiped the dust off the mic on top of my, <laughs> my computer here, so that might have been it. Okay, so anyway, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, swarming. Um, like I said, it's the colony's way of reproducing. Now, granted, the queen is inside of the colony. She is laying eggs, so she is reproducing on the individual level. But as far as the species level, as far as reproduction, it's done through swarming. Now, what you're seeing here in the middle of the screen, and I'm assuming you can see, Shane, can you see my uh, mouse moving around the queen cell? I can indeed, yes. Okay, good. And I hope everybody else can see that as well. This is a cap queen cell. This is a colony that had just swarmed um, here at the lab, and I shot this photo. Normally, the swarms uh, will take off uh, just prior to camping, or, right, or they take off maybe a day or two um, after, you know, when the, when the cap, sorry, when the queen cell will be capped. This particular year, we had massive swarming. And uh, sorry, guys, I'm trying to move forward, and it's not letting me. Uh, 
Jennifer, are you there? Looks like we... Looks like... Uh, is, um, it looks like we've lost Jennifer. Um, lost everything. Lost the feed. Um, can you hear me? Yes, okay, so we can, okay, give me, okay, oh, okay, everyone can hear me, um, give me one second, uh, I'm going to just mute my mic here, I'm going to try and get Jennifer back online and see what's happening, I apologize for that, um, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do, hold on one second. I apologize for the inconvenience, folks. Um, I've tried to get in touch with Jennifer and am unable to, so I'm not sure what's going on down there. At, uh, she's at the uh, University of Georgia B Lab. Um, I, I apologize. I'll try one more time, but I'm afraid if uh, I can't get in touch with her, we might have to reschedule this. I really do apologize uh, for the inconvenience. I know that uh, you're taking time out of your schedules to be here, and I'm sorry that we can't deliver. Just give me one more second, and I'll, I'll see what I can do. Well, that's okay, because I was rambling like mad anyway. Okay, bye.
Shane, can you hear me? I, I can hear you, Jennifer. Um, uh, I'm getting some other uh, people calling in saying that um, they can hear you as well. Um, okay, it, it's 81, uh, 81.6 is what um, megabytes is the size of the program. That's too big for email. I was wondering if that might uh, make things a little easier. Let's go ahead and try this um, uh, one more time again. Um, I've gone ahead and made you the presenter, so you should be able to um, uh, show those, uh, show your screen, and uh, bring up those slides again. Okay, can you see that? Not yet, but uh, let's see what happens here. Still don't have any. There we go. I see the uh, the array of slides there. Okay. No. When, uh, uh, so I, now I did nothing to, uh, indicated to me that I was off air over here. <laughs> so you you just kept right on talking along, didn't you? I just kept on talking. <laughs> we 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 probably missed some good stuff, didn't? No, we? I don't think so. I think I'm rambling. <laughs> this is very strange. Not seeing anybody's reactions, you know. It's like I'm looking it's, at my screen. It's it's a little bit surreal. It's a little bit surreal. Yeah, you know. yourself in a closet, so you know. That's in, right. In office, yep. Um, <laughs> like, okay. Well, uh, I appreciate you getting back on with us, and um, we've. It looks like uh, uh, people are sa sending in now that uh, that they can see um, they can see everything. And uh, so let's give this a go one more time, and hopefully uh, whatever it was um, has gone away, and uh, we're, we'll be back at it. I'm, I'm looking at right now a, uh, a swarm hanging from a, a twig that looks like you're going to shake okay. out in front of a in front of a, a, a hive. So I'm going to go ahead and mute myself again so we don't get much feedback, and, and uh, take it away. So, um, well, I hope you guys can see this, this swarm that our postdoc OHOT is standing next to. This particular colony had swarmed several times. We were able to catch all of them. And one good thing about a swarm, when you're, if you're able to catch them, they will work like dogs for you. They're, it's like bees on steroids. They are incredible as far as building out comb, you know, storing nectar and pollen, getting you know, the queen just hits the ground running. But unfortunately, you have some issues back at home with the new colony. So if you're able to capture some swarms this year, or for you northern folks, maybe you're not quite yet into your swarm season or you just started, because our swarm season pretty much stopped, I'd say, the first week of May. Um, April was our big month. May kind of slowed down, and I haven't, I haven't seen any swarm for the last several weeks. Uh, but anyway, let's talk about the colonies that were left behind. This is an open queen cell. The virgin has emerged, and she is hopefully has walked through the colony. Here, oh, here's a, here's some photos here of virgin the virgin queen emerging. That one in the upper left is her after she has chewed through. Here she comes in the middle. She's actually coming out of the cell, and then finally down at the bottom. She is coming out, and then this particular slide, if you see her, she's up here. I'm taking my mouse and circling her. Um, the first thing that the Virgin Queen wants to do is get to some food. That girl is hungry. Then after, and I want to, oh, here, let me show you this. There, we are having just a little bit of a delay between the advancing of the slides. We're just now seeing the Virgin drinking, uh, drinking some of that syrup after she came out. Just right. so you're aware. So the 21st century is not working as well as we had hoped. It's uh, only the 20 and a half uh, century here at the bee farm. <laughs> I think here at the lab we're still in the 19th century, so that's okay. <laughs> we're on we're on the back back of a farm on a very uh, uh, you know AT&T is our our uh, connection down here, and. Uh, 
we've been cut so many times, our line's been cut so many times, who knows. So are you seeing the, uh, the queen chain? Uh, we we're seeing a, a queen uh, sort of running almost, mostly vertical, uh, just right near some cat brood. Okay. Like I was saying before, the queen, as soon as she emerges, she usually is going to run, get something to eat, you know, collect some nectar. Then she's going to be on the hunt for other queens, other virgin queens. But I did want to stop and show you this particular this particular photo. When you're looking at this queen, notice her abdomen. It's a little triangulated here. It, it's not the long, you know, the, since she hasn't made it, her ovaries have not started to, to develop as well. And, and then, of course, she hasn't, you know, stored any sperm. That abdomen is, is kind of crunched up. After, after she mates and after everything has settled, that abdomen will stretch out and elongate. So this is how you can tell the difference between a virgin queen and a mated queen. The virgin queens are usually much smaller. They're also very flighty. They're running around the colony. So if you see this, the best thing to do is close up the colony and leave them alone for two weeks because it's going to take her that amount of time to orientate herself to the colony or first become, you know, yeah, to orientate herself to the colony, fly out of the colony, mate, come back, and then start laying eggs. So if you see a virgin in your colony, leave it alone for two weeks. Now, um, like I said, the virgin will start looking for other queen cells, for other virgins, because she wants to be the one that reigns that particular colony. And if you're seeing this next slide that I've moved into, you'll see right here where a queen cell has emerged properly. We're not quite there yet. Okay. Okay. Here we are. We, we got it now. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Shane, is there a way you could just, you can indicate to me that you got it? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Thanks. So anyway, what we have here, we have an open queen cell. And then next to it, we have all of these queen cells that have been cut out on the side. What has happened is the virgin queen has come along. She has stung the developing pupa that's inside of these cells. And then she will also try to chew in herself. I've actually seen her do that, seen virgins actually trying to chew into the cell. Um, but then a lot of times after she, is, after she has stung the queen that's in these cells, um, the workers will come along and remove that queen because she has died. Now, the virgin queen, like I was saying, she's got to exit the colony. She has got to memorize her colony, memorize her location. Then she is going to fly and she's going to mate with numerous drones. Now I'm going to talk later about the importance of drones, especially if you're wanting to, if you're wanting to do any queen rearing on your own, or if you're, if you're allowing your, you know, swarms or your other colonies, um, if the queens are going to be emerging and mating, drones are are half the equation and they're very important. So what we, have, what I'm showing here up in this red box, is a queen that is mating with a drone, and all these other these are all drones hanging out here. The queen has flown into the drone congregation area and is now mating. One thing that can be a problem, and this is when I was saying about drones, you want to have a constant source, in source of good drone material in your area if you are going to be allowing your divergence to fly out to mate. Because if you don't, if you're, if you, oh, and let me back up real quick and say this. For you new beekeepers, the ones that haven't started this year or for the ones that have, have been doing it for a couple of years or a year, it is so important that you have two colonies. If you only have one colony, you have nothing to compare it to. And then two, if something happens to that colony, which we're going to talk about here in a second, you have, you have no nothing to give that colony. Like if, if the colony has gone queenless and you need to give them some brood or if you need to give them some pollen frames or you know, if you have a strong colony and a weak colony, that 
strong colony can help out that weak colony. So I highly recommend though you beginners to, to have two colonies minimum. Um, you know, they're, it, it's kind of like having, a, you know, two dogs. You got one dog, you know, might as well get another one so they've got companionship. But, well, bees don't really necessarily. Anyway, you got the idea. So let's get back to sex determination here real quick. The importance of the drones and the importance of bringing in, constantly bringing in new stock into your apiary so that you don't get into what's called inbreeding depression. Now what I'm showing here, this is, um, this is a queen. A queen has 36 chromosomes. I'm sorry, 32 chromosomes. The drone over here has 16 chromosomes. He is basically a half, half queen, okay? Queens are heterozygous, drones are hemizygous. Now, if you notice this XAXB, that is two different sex alleles with two different sets of genetic material. So you have XA and XB on the queen. Now, here we have the drone, which is XC, half of what the queen has. When, when the sperm and the egg here meet, you would have XA times XC, which is going to be heterozygous because it's going to be different at those particular sex alleles, or XB times XC, which again is different and will be heterozygous. Now, just advance to the next slide. If Shane, you can let me know. Now, where an inbreeding depression, we what happens it. is, okay, what happens is that drone has the same genetic material or genetic um, information on the sex allele. So when the, that egg and that sperm cross, what you end up having, you have heterozygous here, like we have, I'd shown you on the previous slide, XA, XB, times XB, which is the same. What you end up with is XB times XB. This is a diploid drone. This drone has 32 chromosomes, and this drone is going is lethal in the wild, and what happens is you get what's called spotty brood, um, shot brood. And I've just put that picture up um, for you to see. So it's a scattered pattern. Um, now there are other things which we'll talk about in a second that could be causing this particular this particular um, you know, pattern, this spotty brood. We got and it. Inbreeding, inbreeding depression is is one of the leading causes for spotty brood or shot brood. So it's very important that if you're going to, you know, be doing some mating down the road with your with your colonies that you're bring in constant, you know, not constantly every year, but you want to bring in new sources of genetic material. It's very very important. And I'm just going through a couple of slides here that show um, again just some what spotty brood pattern. Now, if you come across a colony and um, this time of year and you're seeing this, this stuff, there's several things we can do, but what, what are other causes of spotty brood? Well, you could have disease like American fowl brood or European fowl brood. The queen may not, you may not have inbreeding depression going on, but the queen herself may be failing. She may be too old um, or she wasn't mated properly. And so she's running out of sperm. She may be diseased. She may be ill. She, we, as working, you know, beekeepers working the colony, uh, she may have been slightly injured. Um, you also could have clean, queenlessness, uh, varroa mite infestation. I didn't add. You could also have a small hive beetle infestation. And what's happening is you've got hygienic behavior. Your bees are able to detect, are, uh, detect that something is going on in that cell uncap and remove the diseased or in the infested or infected uh, pupa that is in there. And then finally, spotty brood symptoms, of course, you could have uh, inbreeding like I mentioned. Now, this particular, these particular cells that I'm showing you now that are sitting up along the sides, usually within the actual brood area of the frame, are usually supersedure cells. I wanted to go back, I'm afraid to go back because I may not be able to, but I wanted to show you, remember the cells that I showed you earlier where they were on the bottom of the frame? Those are usually swarm cells, and then when you see cells 
intermixed within a frame of brood, those are usually supersedure cells. And again, supersedure is when um, the, the bees are going to replace the queen because A, she's old, she's failing, she's hurt, she's injured, she's diseased, etc. Now, if by chance your colony is unable to requeen itself, say you had the swarm, um, the swarm is gone, you had uh, cells left behind, those cells emerged, you waited several weeks, nothing happened, you waited three weeks, still nothing's going on in that colony, you're seeing no eggs, no milk brood, which we call, which is just the young larva. Probably what is going to happen, or more likely what is going to happen, is you're going to get into a situation called lane workers. And those workers, because that queen is no longer there, her pheromone is not there, their ovaries, like I'll show you in this picture, will begin to develop, and they will start laying eggs. However, these are unfertilized eggs. These are drone eggs, so they're haploid. There are only 16 chromosomes. Um, so they are not going to uh, produce a worker. So the colony is eventually going to just dwindle down to nothing. The cells that I'm showing you, that's a kind of tight uh, close-up, what happens in laying worker situation are uh, the laying workers will lay very haphazardly inside of that cell. The eggs can be on the side of the cell, on the bottom of the cell. You can have multiple eggs in a cell. Whereas when you have a healthy functioning queen, she lays one cell, or I'm sorry, one egg per cell in the middle, usually. Sometimes a new queen that has just mated and she's just starting to lay eggs, she may look like a laying worker for, for a couple of days because she hasn't caught, quite figured it out yet. So you may see eggs on the side of the cell, but you're not going to see multiple eggs inside of a cell um, more than likely unless you have laying workers. Now this particular um, slide that I'm showing you, this is a laying worker colony. Uh, this, uh, this is all drone brood that you're seeing, and um, within probably another month or so, this colony is going to be completely dead. You can salvage the situation, but it is difficult um, trying to requeen or trying to get a queen into a lame worker colony. I have done it uh, successfully numerous times, and what I do is I'll remove several frames that the, the lane workers have laid on, like this particular frame. I would remove, and I'm going to remove another frame. I'm then going to put in a frame of emerging brood that is emerging that day or the next day, and then I'm also going to put in a frame of very young milk brood, a very young larva. Because what you're trying to do, you want to shift their gears from lane worker into you know, normal worker, activities, which, you know, feeding and pollen foraging, but not laying eggs. Then, so you've got your, your milk brood frame and you've got your emerging brood frame. You want to obviously get a queen in there. Now, if you put a mated queen um, in between those two frames and you leave her there for several days until you pull the cork, see how the bees are acting, more likely that colony will accept that queen. Um, but I have actually had better luck by introducing a queen cell. Um, but I rear queens on a daily basis, so I have access to queen cells. If you have access to a queen cell, you will have better success if a virgin emerges into that colony in between those two frames of milk brood and emerging brood that virgin in, in, emerges into that colony, you will have much better success at requeening that colony than putting a mated queen into that, into that colony. But land worker colonies trying to, um, trying to get, them, get them to accept a queen is, is more difficult. But that is a problem we see this time of year. After our, the swarming season is over, like I said, for whatever reason, the queen was unable to mate or um, or, you know, the virgins fought and killed each other, or she flew out of the colony, got eaten by a bird, hit by a bus, whatever, but she never made it back and she never was able to start laying eggs. Your colony will turn into a uh, land worker colony.
Okay, so the importance of drones, like I was saying it earlier, when I go out and I'm I'm usually doing you know hive assessments, I'll get phone calls, and you know part of my job here at the university is extension, so. I will go out and, you know, somebody says, you know, what's going on? You know, can you come look at my colony? I don't know what's happening here. And one thing I notice a lot is that people constantly are removing all of their drone cells. Um, you know, especially the backyard beekeepers because they feel like, well, the drones, you know, what do they do? You know, they're just going to consume food. They're not really, um, you know, they're not out there foraging. They're not bringing anything into the colony. So to a lot of beekeepers, they're a waste of, a waste of space or a waste of energy. So they're constantly being called out. Well, that's fine if you never plan to, um, to, to make queens um, on your own. So, um, so, Shane, am I still on? Yes, you are. Okay, sorry. The phone rang, so I thought it was you calling me and telling that I had disappeared. <laughs> You're still with us. We're looking at a, uh, a marked queen right now. Okay, good, good. So anyway, like, but like I was saying, the, the drones, if you do plan to have mating going on in your apiary, you do want to have those drones there. Okay, another thing. Um, I'm, I, guys, I have to walk away for just a second and answer this. I'll be right back. Sorry, that was my mother, and if I didn't answer it, she would have kept calling and kept calling and kept calling. So I didn't tell her I was doing this this evening. So anyway, um, make sure everybody calls your mother. Okay, where was I? Bees. Here we go. Um, here in our region, like I was saying, here in the Piedmont, our nectar flow is pretty much over. Now we're gearing up for sourwood, which is up north. Um, into the North Georgia mountains, North Carolina, South Carolina. Uh, for uh, you all further north, I know you're probably still in your nectar flow, and this is the kind of frames that we want to see. Um, if you have, if you, your colonies, uh, for whatever reason, uh, this time of year, you know, springtime coming into summer, are not full of bees, you don't have nice solid brood patterns, um, it, you, it's time to investigate getting in um, some, you know, bringing in new queens and requeening that colony sooner than later. Because if you wait too long um, and that colony starts failing, you may not have have the ability to get enough winter bees to survive over winter. The reason I'm showing you this particular frame, um, if this is if the if the Africanized uh, bees are showing. Another thing is here in the south, um, especially down in Florida, Florida has been been claimed as has Africanized bees. So one thing that you need to be very careful of is when you are um, either a purchasing queens from Florida or if you're in the south is watching the behavior of your bees and how they're reacting. If they become extremely defensive, um, it's time to requeen, get rid of that old queen. Um, you sending material. A lot of people will send us samples here to the lab. We can't do anything with it. Um, it's it has to be sent and DNA analysis and all of that. So it's very difficult to actually uh, scientifically prove whether or not these colonies are Africanized. The best thing, the way uh, we, what we kind of feel is that if the colony is aggressive and it's too aggressive for you to work it, then there's no need for you to have that particular colony. All right. And something else that, now this was something that happened last year, um, but depending on where you are in either the state of Georgia and the south and the north and the west, um, from year to year, pollen flows and nectar flows are going to vary. Some years, like this year here in our area, we made a, a substantial amount of honey. Um, some of our colonies have seven supers on them, and we did great. Last year, uh, we were lucky if we made one or two supers. 
So depending on where you are and depending on, on um, you know, the, the, that particular year, like last year being so cold and, and of course when everything was blooming, the, it was raining and the wind was blowing, so the bees never had opportunity to get out and collect nectar or pollen. But you need to keep an eye, just because you know a nectar flow is going on, and just because you know, you're seeing pollen coming in, doesn't necessarily mean that that colony has enough stores to either make it through the next couple of weeks, the next couple of months, or definitely through the winter. Like I was saying earlier with my, my job in, in extension, I go out and assess colonies, and starvation is still one of our, our biggest reasons why colonies die. People take either too much honey off um, in the summer months or in the fall or the bees just did not, had not, you know, was unable to collect enough honey uh, to get through the winter or even to get through the summer. Here in Georgia, we go through a summer dearth. Nothing blooms from now until October until we may get a little bit of a goldenrod flow. But up until that point, there is nothing there. So if you take off all of the honey and leave nothing for the bees, you're going to have this. And what you're looking at are a bunch of dead bees on the bottom of a box, um, and this colony starved, just literally starved to death. And you can have starvation. You know, we talk a lot about starvation in, in the winter months or um, early spring as colonies are building up rapidly and they're consuming a lot of stores, but not a lot is coming in. Well, you can still have starvation in summer, in the summer months. So feeding, if, you know, check colonies, see how much feed you have on them, how much, how much honey stores are in there, and also check pollen. Pollen is just as important as nectar. If you do not, for whatever reason, the area that you were in, they were unable to collect enough pollen, you're not going to have good brood rearing. And you need that good brood rearing throughout the summer and especially in the fall as they're rearing those bees for their winter bees because they've got to live much longer than the normal bees that are going to be out foraging now. So feeding. Um, we feed a lot here at the university even though um, we don't take all the honey off. We're always splitting and adding colonies for experiments so, you know, what a, a normal colony with two supers would have no problem getting through the winter. Well, now we've made it, you know, into four colonies. Anyway, we have to feed a lot, and we, we feed in, um, we buy sugar in tons here. So what you're seeing on, on this, this is a baggy feeder. Um, this is kind of our favorite way to feed because we can make this up in the lab, fill these baggies. We put the baggie on top of the colonies, split a two to four inch hole, Along the top, the bees come along and they feed um, directly, you know, feed um, on top of the bag. I don't like entrance feeders. Um, I've never been a fan of, or of the top feeders. And I know they have improved a lot over the years. I was using top feeders, um, you know, 10 years ago, and I never could find one that, A, never leaked, um, or, you know, so many bees would get in it and drown. But the thing I don't like about entrance feeders, um, it really encourages robbing. And robbing is something that we're going to start seeing probably, um, usually it's a couple of months after or month after the nectar flow has completely stopped. Nothing is coming in. Uh, there is, you know, no pollen, no nectar. All of your uh, forage bees are home with nothing to do. And they start searching. And they start looking for other opportunities. Or, or an opportunity to steal honey. And if a colony is slightly weakened for whatever reason, or even a strong colony can get beat up on and can, can be totally robbed out. Well, these entrance feeders, you've got that syrup, and especially if you're feeding honey water as opposed to just plain sugar water, you've got that sitting right there in the entrance of the colony, and that scent is very strong, and it will, it will draw in bees to the entrance there. Location is very important, um, you know, where your bees are, as far as if you've been in a location for several years and you're not seeing good nectar flows, move your bees. It may be you just need to move three miles down the road, find another apiary site. I've got, um, between the lab and myself, I've got about 20 different apiary sites. 
and um, I am constantly, you know, trying, you know, this site doesn't work and I'll find another site. I've got ones that work consistently from year to year, and so obviously I keep those, but I have other ones that do not work and I, I move my bees. We had a site up in, uh, up in Blairsville for sourwood, had bees up there for seven years, never made sourwood honey. We moved them 18 miles down the road and we're making sourwood. I mean, we're not making a lot, but it's just location, location, location. Another thing, um, if colonies, if you are having difficult with, difficulty with a colony for whatever reason, the, you know, like um, we were talking about earlier, the queen didn't survive or you were unable to get um, a mated queen in there or they did become land workers and they would never accept a queen or never um, let a virgin, you know, emerge and mate. Com combining colonies now is, is the way to go. Um, and as opposed to just letting that colony die, go ahead and combine it. If it's a land worker colony, what I do is I shake the bees out in the field, let them, you know, fly back, kind of drift back into the various colonies and, you know, just take the frames, either freeze them and then put them into a healthy colony and let them, you know, draw it, you know, or clean it out um, or just, uh, you know, put them in, put them in a strong colony and they'll have them cleaned out in a couple of days. Something else, uh, mites, we, we always need to worry about mites. Um, we're coming into our summer months, and this is when we're going to see mite populations explode. With mites come our viruses. Years ago, we never even talked about viruses. We didn't care that much about virus, form wing virus, uh, chronic bee paralysis, black queen cells, sac brood. They were a paragraph in the back of a book. Well. That's not the case anymore because now we're seeing that these viruses are actually causing a lot more harm to our colonies than we've ever thought. The form wing virus, the one that um, is in the upper left-hand corner, that particular virus is very common. Actually, all bees pretty much have the form wing virus, but it isn't until the bee actually injects it into the hemolymph does symptoms appear. So when you have absence of varroa, like I said, you still have the form wing virus there. However, once varroa moves into the system and populations of varroa start to expand, or um, then that's when we start seeing the symptoms of, of the form wing virus. Other diseases like American foul brood, European foul brood, uh, chalk brood, nosema, these are all things we need to keep our eye on. Uh, small hive beetles, here in the south especially, uh, they can be a, a serious, serious problem. And uh, traps. We've been playing around with a lot of different traps. There's a lot of traps on the market from bottom traps to in-hive traps to top bar traps. And experiment with them. If you're having small hive beetle diff uh, difficulty in your area, experiment with the different traps. Uh, I would not recommend using any chemical other than Kumafos for small high beetle control, because that's the only one that you can legally use. But a lot of beekeepers use what a product called uh, Max Horse, which is fipronil. And we took some wax samples from a beekeeper who's been using it for several years uh, from his capping's wax and had it analyzed. And there were detectable level, levels of fipronil, not only in his capping's wax, but in his pollen and in his honey. So I would not recommend using any chemicals. Try different traps. Those work greatly. Um, Shane, are we almost done? Are we almost done? Are two more slides to go through? Uh, we've got eight minutes, and I'm seeing colony record right now. If you want to, um, I, I know. Go ahead, Shane. I'm sorry. Oh no, I was just going to say I know that uh, you've actually got to get out into your bees this evening. So it's really uh, up to you as, as what sort of time we've got available. Okay, well, I've got a couple more slides. Um, something that I do, <coughs> excuse me, every time I go out into the colonies, um, and, the, and this is just in, as important if you have one or 100 colonies, is keeping a record on what's going on. This particular, this is a, just an example of some of the uh, sheets that I use, colony record sheets that I use. 
up at the top, my yard location since I have numerous apiaries and I always date it. Very important. Colony number um, and then colony temperament because one of the things I do uh, select for is gentleness. And so every time I go into that colony, I'm looking at how's that temperament of that particular colony because it will change. You've got a nectar flow on, you could almost be working Africanized bees with just a veil. Well, and a shirt and stuff. But boy, once the nectar flow stops, um, you know, colonies' temperament change dramatically. So you want to keep a record of that. You know, do you have a queen? Is she marked? You can, you know, you can basically adjust this to your own, um, you know, but like honey stores, and then I always have a place for notes, you know, for comments. Uh, what's going on in that? Is there a bad frame in there or a broken frame, or do I need to bring a queen excluder, that kind of stuff? But it's very important. Colony records are so important. Another thing, too, you know, like procrastination, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. Um, try your best to get out and not put off checking your bees. You know, you don't go out there every day, of course, but, um, you know, keeping an eye on your bees, what's going on, how is the how are the honey stores, you know, have they swarmed, have they been able to, if they did, were they able to requeen themselves? Um, another thing I always recommend to beekeepers, especially newer beekeepers, is to keep up with information because um, things are constantly changing. And especially now with the, the era, with uh, our ability to look at DNA and, um, you know, things are, things are changing drastically. If you can join a beekeeping association, it would be the best thing you can do. Also, get a mentor, someone that you can work with. You know, bees, I mean, you can read the, the, the hive and the honeybee or, you know, uh, first lessons in beekeeping, et cetera. Reading the book is one thing. Uh, actually, working a colony is completely different. Bees don't read books, and you will go out, and, and I'm telling you, they're going to shock you every time. So if you can get with a mentor, someone who's, who's been a beekeeper for a while that can give you hands-on, that's going to be your best learning of, of ability right there. Uh, but like I, I'm showing you here, 25% of beekeepers in the U.S. belong to a beekeeping club, but 75% don't. Only 15% of beekeepers in the U.S. actually subscribe to a beekeeping journal, and 85% don't. There, is, there are two here in the United States, uh, the American Bee Journal and Bee Culture Magazine. Both are great uh, journals uh, that will have information, uh, especially dealing with here in the States. Now, there are ones, of course, overseas. Another thing, too, is, is online. We have a, a, a website. This is actually a, a picture of our old website. We actually have a, a it's been completely renovated, but Check out our website. We have a lot of information there. Um, and also particular individual beekeeping associations have their own websites with information. Um, get involved with other beekeepers. That's, and, and, and like I said, get a mentor. That, that could be the best advice, I think, that anybody could give a brand new beekeeper. Um, so, guys, I have rambled on, and I apologize. This was the strangest uh, 45 minute lecture I have ever given. <laughs> Not being able to see your faces and see what's going on. Uh, but anyway, thank you guys, and I guess we'll go ahead and open it up for questions. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Um, uh, it, is, it is a bit strange, I must confess, uh, sitting inside a, an office just seemingly talking to yourself. Um, we do have some questions, and um, I've sort of been scanning through them as, as you've been speaking. Um, one, just sort of a, a, a point of curiosity, I guess, people are interested about uh, how f high do uh, these mating flights that the queens take, how high are they usually? Um, well, actually, I don't know that. In but we are, this year, we are actually going to try to find our drone congregation areas here in here at the university. Well they're not going to be you know necessarily directly over our lab. But I have seen pictures of how to do this and I would say the pole that the general the picture that I'm thinking of by memory that he's holding was probably about thirty feet tall and what he done or what he had done is put a queen lure on the very top of that pole 
and just walk through the fields until he started seeing drones. Now, do they fly up higher? I, I'm sure they do. I do. I just don't know that. I don't know the foot. You know how exactly high. But I know you can see them. So. Okay. There's a couple questions about uh, laying worker colonies. You you mentioned your method of installing brood, uh, putting in a queen, whether it be a uh, a queen cell and allowing that cell to the virgin to emerge out, or a uh, a mated a mated cage queen. Um, one person asked, you know, about the uh, the method that you hear often, which is basically tear apart your colony, carry the frames a hundred so feet away, shake all the bees off, bring the equipment back to its uh, original location and reassemble things. What do you think about that method of, of dealing with a laying worker? Well, it depends. If you're wanting to, to dispose of that colony and get rid of it completely, yeah, shake the bees out, then, you know, do something with your frames, either give them to other colonies or freeze them and uh, let, you know, another colony go ahead and, and clear them out. But if you just shake those bees out in the field, and kind of the idea is that the laying workers are not going to be able to fly back, so you're leaving the laying workers in the field where the rest of the bees are going to fly back. Well, I, I, I've been told that's not necessarily the case, that the laying workers will fly back to the colony. But what you've not done anything for that colony. You've got to get, like I said, you, you've got to shift the gears and the thinking inside of that colony. If you put a frame of emerging bees, you have a new flux of, of young bees that are not in that land worker stage. And then two, with that brood that they're working on, they're starting to feed, they're shifting their gear from land worker to they've got something to do. Um, but if you just shake bees out in the field, You've really accomplished nothing as far as getting another queen in there to requeen it, um, you know, getting a mated queen or a you know a queen cell, etc. Yeah, I think it's I think it's worth mentioning too that really that you you put that slide up there of of the reproductive structures of of a quote unquote normal worker, a laying worker, and a virgin queen, and and sort of seeing how uh, I guess the size of those. Um, it's it's worth noting that that uh, the the laying workers, I understand it, um, their reproductive structures, of course, they're female, but they become active really as a result of um, the lack of queen pheromone in conjunction with the lack of brood pheromone. And so your method uh, addresses both of those. And I I too have heard that the whole shake it you know a hundred feet from the hive really doesn't work very well that those laying workers can make it back and you haven't fixed the problem at all. You've just sort of decimated your colony even that much more. Um, and so by, like you said, putting that brood in there, putting a new queen in there, a good uh, vigorous queen or a virgin queen that's sort of can slowly assimilate in takes care of uh, the lacking pheromones and, and sort of suppresses the reproductive systems again. Uh, at least that's that's my understanding of, of um, how that that works. Is, is that yes. is that true? Correct. Okay. Good job, Wayne. <laughs> um, the another question along those same lines is you you mentioned brood that's just, just on the verge of, of coming on out uh, in that laying worker colony. You said uh, you know coming out tomorrow, emerging tomorrow, or maybe two days. What's what method do you use to determine what brood to pull from a colony that's right on the brink of emerging out? Do you uncap some cells to look at? I do. Okay. Well, either either I uncap and I'm looking for purple eye pupa, which you know are a few days away from emerging, or I'm actually seeing the frame. I'm seeing these actually emerging from the cells as I pull that frame. I mean, they're, you know, baby bees are coming out as I'm walking the frame over to the next colony. But if I have nothing in that particular apiary that's emerging right then, I will uncap a few, and I'm looking for purple eye pupa, as opposed right. to wide eye or the pre-pupa, which is still, you know, a week away from emerging. Great. Um, we've got a, a person here that... that uh, <laughs> It's sort of hard to, to, to get a tone of, of frustration through typed questions, but it, it, I can sort of almost det detect the frustration in this person's voice. 
when they say that they've got an overwintered colony that has swarmed multiple times, even the new queens are swarming, depleting the hive um, and making it easily robbed, uh, what can they do? So these are like secondary, tertiary swarms where, where the virgins are going out and, and it just seems like it's, an, it's a non-stop process. What do, you, do you have any solutions to that where the hive swarms, but it doesn't stop there, it keeps on going? That's what happened this year um, with our particular colonies, or some of our colonies. They just, like, you know, we had four swarms, and I was just, you know, okay, I'm going to split them. You know, oh, this is something. Um, there's, at this point, you know, just make sure you try to get a queen in there, a lane queen. If they're, if they're getting robbed out, move them. But in the future... If we have these kind of nectar flows like we experienced here in, in uh, the Piedmont region, what I what I was told in talking to some other beekeepers, and I did try this in my personal hives, and it seemed to work, is to remove all of the queen cells except for maybe one or two. If they keep swarming, they've got in their head there's nothing you can do if they're going to swarm without virgins. I mean, there's nothing you can do. But this, what, it, what this beekeeper explained to me was, if they, if they have 20 some odd queen cells in there, they're going to keep swarming until they feel that the population level is down enough. Um, but, you know, if they've only got one or maybe two queen cells, because you've cut everything else out there, you've only left the, the two nicest looking cap cells in there. And you put them close together so when one emerges, she's going to run over and kill the other one. And the reason he was saying leave two is because, you know, just in case one is damaged for whatever reason, um, then you're going to hopefully cut back on those secondary, tertiary kind of, you know, multiple swarming. You're just going to have, you know, you just have that primary swarm. Um, like I said, I've tried that um, in some of my colonies after I got the information. It seemed to work. Um, so I, 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 that's the only advice I can give you. So. Okay. Um, you mentioned, uh, again, related to the laying worker um, issue of perhaps introducing a cell, um, and, and you've also talked about some virgin queens uh, here this evening. Um, this particular question is regarding how best to introduce either a cell or a, a virgin queen to a colony. Are, is there anything different with introducing either a cell or a virgin versus a mated queen in a cage. What tricks do you have for folks out there? Um, because this person's having some problems with uh, poor acceptance. Okay, um, introducing a virgin queen is very difficult. Um, either, if I had my choice, I would introduce um, into a, okay, let's, okay, we're strictly talking lame worker colonies right now. If I had my preference, I would introduce a cell, a queen cell, that's going to emerge within the next day or two. Because you don't obviously you don't want to move cells too early because the, the pupa can become damaged. So I usually move cells on. I, well, I'm not going to get into that. Anyway, you want to move an older cell. That's my my first preference. My second preference would be a mated queen. The third preference would be a virgin. Um, the virgin has already emerged. There is something about that that virgin. If you put that queen cell in and she emerges in 12 hours, which I have done. They've accepted it first. But if you, I have also put in virgin queens in a cave and come back the next day and she's dead. They have not accepted her. Um, I've had very, it, it's, it, and I've even, you know, trying to, um, trying to get colonies, normal colonies, to accept an emerged virgin is very difficult. It just, for some reason, it's like they don't think that she's theirs because she did not emerge from her cell in that colony. Um, you can do it, but it takes a little time. Um, you can't be impatient. But if you are having, if you have a lame worker colony and you can get a hold of a queen cell, I would, I would recommend to do that. If you've got another colony that maybe has a queen cell on a frame, transfer it over to that lame worker colony and let them, let that queen emerge into that colony. The problem with using mated queens is usually you're paying for a mated queen. And if you're paying $20, 30 $40 for a queen and, you know, the, 
the success rate of getting a, a lame worker colony to accept that queen is about 50, 60 percent. In my experience, um, you, you, you wait, you're possibly going to waste some money. If your only alternative is a virgin, what I would do is put the virgin in there with no attendance at all. Um, go ahead and, and have queen candy in there for her so that she has an ability, a way to feed herself until those bees start accepting her. Put her in between a frame of emerging brood and a frame of milk brood. And I also would take a little bit of honey and kind of smear it on the outside of the cage so that the bees will immediately come over and start licking that honey off of the cage. I don't know if this works. It's just something I've done. I've always done whenever I introduce a queen. And um, the bees immediately will come over to that cage, start licking the honey off. And in my, you know, short amount of time that I've been beekeeping, I think, well, they're spreading her pheromone about the colony that much quicker. Um, so anyway, I hope that answered your question. Um, did I answer that, that question? Uh, I, I think you did. And then some. Good, good. All right. Um, we, we've got uh, a lot of questions. You showed that slide of hive beetle, which has really generated uh, a lot of interest. And, and of course, there's a lot of traps. Uh, wow, they're really advancing well now. <laughs> uh, there's a, a lot of traps out there and um, a lot that don't use any sort of pesticide or anything like that. Do you, do you use any um, traps? And if so, which ones do. do you recommend? I do. Um, I don't, now, I, I've never liked the bottom traps because they're just so messy with all the oil. And I'm usually, you know, I'm, I'm running 150 colonies personal, you know, sometimes up to 200 colonies at the lab. And it's just, it's expensive, messy. Um, so the, the traps I've always liked are the AJ Beetle Eaters, which are the little, the traps, the little black traps that you set in between the frames. Um, either in the brew chamber or in the, in the honey super, and I'll get back to that in just a second because that depends on the time of the year. There's also the uh, Lawrence Cuts Betel, Better Beetle Blaster, um, which is the same concept as the AJ Beetle Eater, but it has a deeper reservoir um, so that it holds more oil. Well, there's also another trap that's out on the market, and it's Miller, and I'm looking for, darn it, I'm looking for the... Um, the trap, but anyway, the thing that's different about his trap, and I, I believe his name, the name is Miller Bees, and if somebody knows, please type that in to Shane so that um, we can get this information out because these things look great. I've just put them into my colonies. They're the same concept. They're a plastic trap that sits on top of the, the top bars, fits in between the top bars. You fill it with oil, but he's got the reservoir separated into three, sec three separate chambers so that you're not going to spill the oil as easily if you're, you know, if the colony is slightly tilted or you're pulling it out of the colony and it slightly tilts because oil will kill bees just as quickly as it will kill beetles. But the thing I like about his trap <clears throat> are, is, the, is the lid itself. The, be the beetles come in, but he's got a lip on that lid, that entrance, so the beetles can't come back out. And I've seen beetles coming, walking out, covered in oil, walking out of the AJ beetle eaters and the beetle blasters. Um, but those are my preferred method, you know, for, for uh, high beetles. Another thing for high beetles is sun versus shade. Um, and, and I see this every time. I've got, a, I've got a, a, one of my favorite apiaries because it, uh, it's got such a great blackberry and privet bloom down there. I make a ton of honey, but unfortunately the colonies are, are mostly in the shade. And my small hive beetle problems there are, I mean, see this picture here of all the small hive beetles in the corner? That's what I get. I'll get massive small hive beetles. I never get the larval activity, but I'll get massive small hive beetles in the corners, either on the inner cover or down um, on the bottom board. But when, I'm, when I have my other colonies in the sun, I have small high beetles, but I have one or two here and there. So sun versus shade, um, if you can uh, get a good amount of sun on your colonies, what my, what's the perfect situation 
is morning sun till about three o'clock in the afternoon, and then you then you get some shade on those colonies. Um, but I was oh another thing I wanted to say, placement of these traps is very important. During the, uh, when we're coming out of winter, you want to place those traps or in winter around the cluster. Because I'm sure if you did any winter evaluations or, you know, you were checking your colonies in um, late winter, you were seeing small hive beetles actually in the cluster. So I would put those traps very close to the cluster. But as the colony is, you know, now expanded, it's warm out, our nights are not cold, those beetles are now starting to migrate up into the honey supers. If you use frame spacers, beetles love frame spacers. They're going to get up underneath there. They're going to get in between the frames and in the corners. That's where I put the traps now. Um, I see, I look and see where are the beetles. That's where I'm going to put the traps. All right. Anything else you want to know about small beetle traps? Um, the one you're referring to, actually, I've got some samples. I'm holding one right now. It's called uh, the Beetle Jail, and uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna probably start carrying them because I do I do like the design. Um, like Miller Miller bees or yeah, I've got I've got his business card here somewhere, but uh, that I can't put my hand on. Um, but I've I've got a question now. I need you to put on your researcher cap here, your objective researcher cap, and not Jennifer Berry, the queen uh, breeder slash seller, um, because there's a question about how often you should requeen your colony. And I'll preface this by saying, when I first got started in the industry, everyone said, you know, every two years, maybe every year, and I just thought it was a ploy by the bee, uh, the queen producers, to try and sell more queens. So what are your thoughts, the object, this is now, we're looking for the objective researcher here, and when should you requeen a colony? Okay, well, you know, the thing I love about beekeeping is there's about 100 different answers to that particular question. Um, and, and you talk to one beekeeper, he's going to tell you one thing, you talk to the next one, he's going to tell you completely opposite. So, in a uh, objective mind, um, I do not think you need to buy queens every year if you buy good queens. If you buy queens that have been well mated, um, who have um, you know had the opportunity to start laying before they've been caged and shipped off. So if you are buying good queens, I don't think you need a requeen every year. Um, I have queens three, four years old in my in my apiaries. Now they're there for a particular reason, for research purposes. Or I just leave them on. They're still doing well. Why get rid of them? Um, you know, I'll put them off in a nuke, split them off to keep them from swarming and see, you know, see how they do. Now, as far as what time of year to, to requeen, I prefer requeening in the fall. And that's because of the area that I live. And it's going to depend on where you live. And when does your nectar flow hit? And how early can you get queens? Early queens can be very dangerous, not dangerous, but, but you can have issues with early queens. If we have wet, cold winters or wet, cold springs, even in Florida, in California, South Georgia, queens are not going to be mated properly. And so you want early queens because you want that colony to, to accept the new queen, get her going before your nectar flow hits so that you're going to make a lot of honey. Well, if you get a poorly made a queen, you've just blown the whole thing for that year. What I prefer, because we do, our, our nectar flow starts here in February. Actually, our pollen. Pollen and nectar starts um, with the red maple in February. So I like to do, um, you know, in August to September requeen. That, that, that queen has, has given me enough time. I can evaluate her, make sure she's a good queen going into the winter. She comes out of the winter. She hits the ground running. Now, the only problem with that is you can have an increase in swarming because the bees technically think this is an older queen because she is than if you bring in, uh, bring in a new queen. So swarming is going to be more of an issue that you've got to look at. So, you know, it's tit for tat. I mean, which, which, where do you go? Um, you know, you may have issues if you try to requeen. You may have swarming if you've already requeened in the fall. So that's as objective as I can get. How's that? That, uh, that wasn't bad. 
Wasn't bad. Um, Jennifer, I, I know that uh, before we, we chatted, before we started here this evening, that you mentioned you needed to get out into the bees uh, this evening. And I, I, I appreciate your time. And, I, and to the folks listening in, I apologize for uh, the techno uh, technological issues that we had. I do have um, one question that I'd, I'd like to, to ask, um, that, one last question. And this is regarding sort of the, the change in temperament. Um, you know, we, we, we phrased the, the title of this as when hives go bad, uh, and that, that a lot can take a lot of different meaning to it. Um, and, and there's a person out there that's curious to know what to do about a colony that is, has seemingly gone from a nice, docile uh, colony to one which is, uh, I don't want to use the word aggressive because I always like to think of honeybees as being defensive and not aggressive, but really a heightened level of uh, defensiveness and, and perhaps not necessarily in conjunction with a dearth because you mentioned that, that uh, when you were talking about notes and recording information and things like that, that the temperament can change based on nectar flows and such. Um, what, what might cause something like that and what's the best strategy in trying to deal with a colony that, that uh, for really unexplained reasons has has gone bad, has gone mean. Well, if it's, if, let's, just, let's just assume it's the same queen because we could have a, a, you know, numerous different scenarios that colony is formed, you know, and you don't know it, and, you know, the new queen is mated with, with drones with more aggressive genes, et cetera. But let's assume that's the same queen. Um, you started off in the spring. She was great, docile, gentle. Well, what happens as the year progresses is those bees, you're getting more and more bees in that colony. More and more bees, and, and this is personal experience, and, you know, since I've been keeping bees, a nuke, you can work practically without smoke, without a veil, nothing. You know, short sleeves, t-shirt, you know, pair of shorts. But when you start getting into colonies like the starter finishers that I run, which are, you know, three three deep boxes full of bees and three super medium supers full of bees, um, you better better have a smoker lit and you better be wearing a veil. So it, it, it could be population. You know, the more bees you have, plus the more bees, the more you're going to be crushing bees, you're going to be releasing that alarm pheromone. Um, so and it can go up on an exponential you know, level very quickly. But say you have a normal size colony, um, you know, you've been, uh, you pulled some honey off, you know, you still may have a flow going on, and they turn aggressive, I would requeen that colony immediately. As far as I'm concerned, I don't, I don't want to work bees if they're going to be aggressive or defensive, um, especially the ones that are going to follow me out of the apiary or follow me from colony to colony. I don't want to, I don't want to work them. I don't care how good of a queen she is. I don't care how much honey she's producing. I don't care how resistant she is to Varroa. If I can't work a colony, what is the point of being a beekeeper? I mean, if you can't get in there and enjoy working the colonies, and you know, then I, what's the point? So, if a colony has become extremely defensive, um, I would requeen them immediately. I would go in there, pinch the queen, you know, uh, we'll order you a new queen, find out how long it's going to take, and then go in there and pinch the queen. But if you're willing, like I said, if, if the colony is overpopulated or has a, a large population, split them off. Uh, get that population level down. Um, make more bees and uh, get and then you know get new queens and see how see how they act then. But I just I I have no no tolerance for uh, aggression or defensiveness. I just I I don't I don't I don't want to get stung. I don't like nasty bees so. Um, maybe I'm maybe I'm throwing too much of my own personal opinion in there on on that particular question, but I would requeen it if it became defensive. Well, I'll throw my personal opinion in there as well. That uh, most people listening in now have, have tuned into enough of these that know that uh, I've got two little boys, and and the oldest is really starting to take an interest in going out there with Da working the bees. And uh, I, I agree with you, Jennifer, that um, those those sort of hot queens really have no in my opinion, no business in, in the industry because it can really complicate things for for people other than that, just that beekeeper. Uh, if that colony is in a, 
in an urban setting that's causing problems, it causes problems for all of us. So I agree that we need uh, we need docile bees um, and exactly. be selecting anything other than that. Um, Jennifer, that was that was the last question. As I as I promised, I really appreciate you tuning in. And again, I apologize to those that listening in for the technological issues that we had at the beginning, but it worked out. We got through it. I will give uh, Jennifer a shameless plug in that we have some queens of hers available. They are top-notch queens. Um, if anyone's interested, give us a call. And, and the latest is that uh, the reason, I think, while she needs to scoot out is uh, she might have some extras available for us that, uh, Jennifer, if I remember correctly, you might be able to ship out June 7th. Is that what we talked about? Uh, if we give you that list. So um, we... Uh, <clears throat> if, if you're interested, let us know. We won't have a final count until I let her off this line and let her go out there and check out those queens and do a final assessment. Um, but if you're interested, we do have some available for later in summer as well. They are good quality queens, and, and that's the end of my shameless plug for Jennifer Berry Queens. Um, Jennifer, once again, thank you so very much for taking okay, some time you. and working with us here this evening. Um, well, thank you, guys, and... Uh Maybe, maybe the next webinar will be a little more comfortable. So appreciate y'all's time, and you guys have a wonderful evening. We'll talk to you soon, hopefully. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night.